welcome to DRS with Ash, and we've got a very, very interesting guest. And I'm not sure a lot of people would be guessing who this person is. Uh, I don't think you had any hunch that we'll have Mr. Michael Vaughan on my show. Welcome on the show. Thank you so much for being kind. Thank you very much. Um, I, I couldn't think of a, a better way to spend a Saturday afternoon. It's absolutely hosing it down in the UK. Uh, I'm watching the England under 19s getting, well, the four wickets down in the, the World Cup final to India. Uh, so you've probably got me at the right time. India are well <laughs> on top. Okay, just before we got, uh, got, uh, got going live, a lot of people, Michael, I just find it a little, uh, sometimes a little bit of a disconnect because we are in different parts of the world that uh, your humor goes for a toss sometimes. And uh, you're extremely funny. Uh, I, I would have loved to start this conversation with your cricket because I was a big fan of your batting. Uh, we will get there, but I think I'm an even bigger fan of your cheeky humor on uh, Twitter. Uh, can you talk talk us a little bit about it? Is it is it the Yorkshire humor, or is it just that you like riling up Indian fans? Oh, I, I, I think um, you know. I think in India you've got the most um, passionate cricket fans. You know, what I, I love cricket. You know, whoever's playing, I'll, I'll be watching, and I just like to see good cricket. I like to see uh, you know high class bowling batting you know i don't care who delivers the high class I, i'm more than happy to uh compliment uh, any, any player from any team but there's something about the indian fans that uh, i i just can't help myself and just just every now and again just uh poking the fire just to just to get a reaction um and they react very quickly uh they they don't seem to uh take a breath they don't take a breath and just take a, a moment to to consider reaction of any kind of note they just come straight back in um oh, it's, it's a bit of fun it's a bit of humor but i i think anyone that knows me closely knows uh, how passionate um I, I am about the game how passionate i am about indian cricket um it is the powerhouse in, in the world game whether whether that's right or wrong and whether you guys are a little bit too powerful that that's another debate but um i i hugely love coming to india uh, my favourite place in the world, and actually my family, we, we, we've been on holiday all over the world, but my kids just love coming to Mumbai. They love spending time in Mumbai. Uh, we love the Taj Hotel. Uh, we love sitting by that pool and hearing all the horns from the cars going by. Uh, we love going to the Madan Oval just to, to see cricket. Uh, my little lad's had a net or two there, which uh, he keeps pestering me to uh, get back to Mumbai to go into the academy. Big Sachin, as I call him, uh, runs an academy over there and uh, he's always inviting my lad to go and uh, participate. So uh, hopefully next year when times are a little bit better, uh, I'll be able to get to Mumbai once again. So just clearing the deck to all the Indian fans, when Michael puts something up on Twitter, just take a bit of a pause, consider your nah. reaction and then respond. Nah. <laughs> Which like, is not going to happen. Nah. I'm just trying nah. to make a plea. It's not going to happen. Yeah. There seems to be a, an obsession with um, the Indian fans uh, are named at me about pitches because I, I, I took the mick out of a, a couple of test pitches that were prepared last year in India against England. <laughs> um, I saw those. They, yeah, they seem to, they seem to um, always want to talk about pitches and uh, if there's any grass on the wicket or any kind of movement laterally, uh, it's England doctoring the pitches once again. Uh, they, they seem to ha have a great deal of joy in England getting hammered in Australia uh, over the last couple of months. England getting bowled out for pretty much next to nothing on a, on a regular basis. Uh, I, I kind of threw the, the, the kind of uh, the nets out there last year when you guys were bowled out cheaply in Adelaide. Um, you know, and then all of a sudden you, you, you bounce back incredibly well to, to win that series uh, from 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 a position of difficulty. Virat going home, and then obviously Ajinka getting the captaincy, one 0 down in Australia. Not many teams have come back from that kind of position, and uh, that for me in the last probably ten or fifteen years, that's that's the, the greatest Test series victory that I've seen be, because of the um, you know the, the turmoil with with all the players coming and going. There was obviously COVID times, there was injuries. Uh, Siraj was unearthed and, and produced magic. You hung in there and had a bit of chirp with Tim Payne in Sydney. I enjoyed that. <laughs> 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 I bowled pretty well, but you still remember the banter with Tim Payne. Oh, Tell the yeah, thing or two about how much you love banter. Oh, I, 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 I like to see the Aussies get a bit back. And I think you gave a, a little bit back and by hanging around all day, pretty much. Um, and, and to get that draw and then to go on to uh, the Gabba, where the Aussies don't lose in Brisbane. They never lose. And you guys to beat them with that chase on the last day. Uh, I, I do think it's the, the best Test Series victory. And I'm not just saying it because you're here, but 
I honestly do think that with everything that you had to put up with all the all the turmoil in the changes of the team to to win the last game in Brisbane where Australia just don't lose uh, and Rishab to to play the way that he did um it was special very very special that uh, series victory and uh, any team that beats Australia they're always a good team for me to watch <laughs> Right, we're back onto cricket. Uh, you obviously pulled me into cricket from banter, so we're going to talk. Go back way, go way back in time. Um, I was in my formative years watching this Test series, and I must tell you that because you, I mean, it's not like a compliment that I'm giving back. That 2005 Ashes in England, where England took on Australia, has to be my greatest watching memory of Test cricket. And uh, uh, so many people, so many guys who used to play club cricket with me in Chennai used to back Australia. But I somehow love the brand of cricket that you guys played. Uh, can you talk to talk a little bit a little bit through that series? Uh, a star-studded Aust Australian lineup. Even if I look back and see that series right now, it it sort of makes me feel wow, what an Australian side, and what have these English cricketers done? And can you talk 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 to us a bit about that series? How was the build-up? Yeah. Michael won yeah. the captain. Oh, you, you're only as good as the players you take out. Um... I guess we had to play a, a, a brand of cricket that matched Australia. They were very uh, aggressive, uh, very powerful. Uh, they, they liked to score quickly. Um, so we, we had to match them with, with our scoring rate. So the likes of Kevin Peterson, that was his debut series. He was a, uh, a player that you know we desperately wanted to get into the side because of the manner that uh, he played. Uh, we felt that he, he had a game to be able to take Shane Warne and Glenn McGrath on. Um, and then obviously, I think all, all really good teams, they need that prominent all-rounder. And to have Freddie Flintoff uh, in the form that he was uh, playing uh, and to have a bowling attack with a bit of pace, so you can you can throw a bit of fear back into the Australian uh, batting lineup. And with Simon Jones, Steve Harmison, Hoggard, Freddie Flintoff, um, with a little bit of Ashley Giles over the wicket, holding and doing a great job. Uh, it was a rounded attack, so I was fortunate to, to have that attack. Uh, and we got the ball swinging around. Um, and we got it reverse swinging uh, and, and we won good tosses. We batted first on four of the five occasions, which was important, particularly when you're playing against Shane Warne. I mean, I think Warne got 40 wickets in the series and yet he ended up on the, the losing side. Um, uh, it, it was our time. We, we, we played risky cricket, which I, I believe sometimes when you play against really good teams, I, I think if you're not quite as good, you almost have to risk a little bit more. You know, you have to play a little bit more risky, and, and that's what we tried to do. Uh, and little things went our way. Glenn McGrath uh, tripping up on a ball on the morning of the second test, being ruled out. Uh, Ricky deciding to have a ball first, which uh, we were quite happy with. Um, just little things throughout the whole series. We we were pretty much fit all the way through, apart from the last game where um, we lost Simon Jones. Um, and we had players all in form. All our batters kind of were in form, playing with confidence. Uh, and playing with that freedom. I think when you're in a team and you get on a roll, and you, you'd have felt it so many times in your career, when, you, when you're in a group and you're on that roll, it, it's the best environment in the world. Because you just believe someone in, in your team will get you out. Even if you go through a tricky hour or two, you just think someone will get you out of that tricky position. And vice versa, when you're in a team that's like, like England have just been in Australia, you pretty much knew every time it went bad, it was going to go really bad. You know, you could just sense that the, the confidence wasn't with the England side. They didn't really have that ultimate belief to uh, get themselves out of tricky positions because they were up against a better team. But um, it, it's like the best feeling in the world when you're in that group and you know that you've got confidence around you. Uh, you can play confident cricket. You can play risky cricket, uh, flamboyant cricket. Uh, when you don't have those confident players around you, it's very, very difficult to play in that fashion. Right. Before, before I actually go into the current uh, scenario and the situation, Right now, uh, I'd like to just harp upon uh, one man that you played a lot of cricket. I mean, a lot of cricket under, if I may say so. Yourself, Nas, and all all those guys was Duncan Fletcher. Uh, I saw a recent documentary which was like Fletcher years, and I saw him being featured. And the records don't look all that mightily impressive, but he's left a bit of impression on all of you, hasn't he? Uh, yeah. What sort of an impact did he have? And I remember that. I even asked Ricky recently with that run out at Trenbridge in the 2005 Ashes on uh, what he felt about it and why he was having a go at the English dressing room when he got run out. And uh, the answer he gave me was uh, it was Duncan Fletcher. So he's not only had an impact on you guys, he's clearly had an impact on the others as well. Yeah, I mean, he, he was, uh, I, mean, I mean, you've worked with him as well. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant cricket thinker. 
You know, and I, I'll always say this. I think the England cricket team, the English game, uh, missed a massive trick when he when when he was with the England side and, and, and coaching the team. He did a great job and, and, and he, he had his favourites and he had his people that he, he was really good with. And, and obviously a few didn't get on quite as well with him and fell out with him, which is natural. But I, I always thought when he was manoeuvred from the coaching position, they should have used him in the academy. He, he should have been like the, the coaching guru of English cricket. He should have been teaching our next generation, not just our next generation of players, uh, but our next generation of coaches as well. And I think we missed a massive trick by allowing him to 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 go off and, and, and obviously went in a, in a little bit of a bitter state because of the the way that he was um, removed uh, from the side. Uh, I, I, I think England would have been in a miles better position now. Um, the longevity of our team and the players that we would have produced would have been more of a consistent, high quality standard with Duncan Fletcher helping uh, within an, our academy, maybe around the counties, just, just passing on his information because I always felt it was around five years ahead of the game. He talked about things that happened five years later. You know, he was always talking about the reverse sweep, the sweeps back in the early 2000s, late 90s. It didn't really come to fruition until around 2012, 13, when everyone started to play that shot. Uh, he was talking about it in 99, 2000. You know, these are the shots that we've got to be learning. Uh, they're the shots that are going to put the captains of the opposition under more pressure. You're going to put spinners under more pressure. You've got all these tricks. Um, so he was always ahead of his time. So we, I, I think we missed a trick. Um, yeah, you know, when you, when you work with a good coach, they don't necessarily say too much. But it's what they say, you kind of go, oh, yeah. And they always trigger you and they get you thinking. They get you going, well, why? Why would you do that? And then you kind of analyse it and you, you, you realise and, and you go, oh, yeah, that, that, that's probably going to improve my game or improve our, our team's chances of being more successful against that bowler or in that situation. Uh, and that's what Duncan Fletcher brought. I thought he was a, a genius uh, cricket thinker. <laughs> the problem, though, with people who are ahead of their time is that it always challenge and challenges the conventions. It makes yeah. people uncomfortable. And hence, you need stakeholders who need to back you to the hill to say, OK, this guy is different. He's ahead of his time and we need to back him. And it's quite it's always it's always going to be a bit of a balance that we need to strike. Anyway, just moving on from Fletcher. I mean, I completely loved working with him, had a lot of great ideas. Some some you can agree to, but he was great on agreeing to disagreeing, which I kind of like with uh, Duncan. Mm. Uh, but anyway, moving on with that from that, Michael, the recent uh, Ashes series where I saw you get into uh, Australia, you got hit by COVID, didn't you? Like for yeah. a bit, and you were <laughs> you were you were isolating as the series had begun. Uh, what did you think of the whole series? I, I I know I've been on overseas tours where things don't go your way, and then it starts falling downhill. What what exactly did you feel? How did you feel about the whole tour? Forget about how well England Australia played, but how did you feel about the whole uh, thing around English cricket? Uh, be, be honest, I, it, it was disappointing because I, I I I felt that the England team aren't as good as Australia. I don't think they're as good a team, but they certainly are not so bad to be hammered four 0 and not to compete. You know, and I think when you start looking at the basics of the game and and you know selection. You know, they got the selection completely wrong on probably two or three occasions. That, that's, that's nothing to do with bubbles. That's nothing to do with the times that we're in. That's just pure cricket thinking that they got wrong. And then you start thinking about the basics of the game. You know, they bowl so many no balls. You know, they drop so many chances. You know, these are the basics of the game that, you know, teams, even, even though they're not as good, they should be able to deliver the basics of the game. And England didn't deliver the basics. Um, fitness didn't look like... They were as fit. Um, it, it just looked like it was it was a tour that you just spoke about, but it was almost as if it, it started to go wrong and downhill before it even started. You know, and that, that that's happened to England and Australia now. Like we go in the twenty first century, I got beat four one there in two 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 three. Um, six seven lost five nil. We managed to beat them in ten eleven three one. Uh, Thirteen fourteen five nil. 17, 18, 4 nil, and now again 4 nil. So it's a common trend that England go to Australia with all this hope and the, the talk that the, the good game, you know, that we can compete with Australia. Ultimately, our system hasn't produced good enough players and teams to go and compete with that Cookaburra ball on those Australian wickets. And the Ashes is a, you know, big, big series. It's all about pressure and how you deal with it. And when you've got, a, you know, a group of players that, 
necessarily aren't quite as good, you've got to work ways into your system to give them confidence and to just believe they can compete. And I just didn't think England had that mindset and belief to, to just compete and stay in the game. You know, I look at the way that you guys played last year and you just hung in there, you stayed in the game. And that was by batting long periods of time, uh, hanging in there with the ball, not necessarily whipping Australia out, but hanging in there. And then, you know what, you can pressure them on late on day four and into day five. England, over the last two or three years, and you had it against England last year, I always think that, and, and you might not want to be honest and tell me because you're still playing, but I always think teams that play against England know that if they have a bad session, it's an awful session. You can beat England in Test cricket in one session because they'll collapse. And I don't know if it's just this modern group of players or, um, you know, the kind of quality is not quite there. I, I'm not too sure, but I just know now for the last three or four years watching this Test match side is there's a real problem with the batting that when they lose one wicket, I always say, I'm, I'm like this on the commentary, Mike, because you think there's another one coming straight away. You know, I, I, I'm, I dread thing how many hat-trick balls we've called over the last three or four years because it's happened so continuously. Uh, and that's a mental issue. That that's not that's not technical. That that is a, a mental issue in the dressing room that uh, England have got to try and fix quickly. Um, I, I think Justin Langer is going to be in his next coach. There you go, Ash. There's your there's your story. I, I think that's who England will turn to. I think they'll they'll try and get Justin I saw Langer. You, I saw you, I saw your tweet today, and I saw a tweet by uh, uh, Brian Cowdale. Was it? Who is it? Something saying that Justin Langer has done really well enough to become the England coach, if not the Australian coach. So <laughs> yeah. I didn't see that. Uh, look, I, think, I I have a serious question to ask. I mean, as a cricketer and somebody who's sort of academically inclined towards wanting to know these things, uh, I played a bit of county cricket. Um, and I've played a bit of cricket in Australia. I played a bit of cricket in India, obviously. Uh, putting all these things together and also seeing that interview by Zach Crawley. I'm sure you would have, you would have read it. Yeah. Where he spoke about the kind of pitches being produced and how difficult it is sometimes to play. I'm... I'm I'm, I would love to know, like in your in your generation and that one year where Andrew Strauss led the uh, English side to Australia and won the Ashes, it's probably the one victory that England have had in Australia. Is it, is the, is the reason, could the reason well be with the ball that's being used in England or the kind of pitches, the pace of the pitches? Is it a bit slow in some of the pitches in England? Could all of those factor into it? Uh, because Sometimes I, I just I just found that it was that extra bounce in the low hands or something like that. So from a mm. from a techni technicality perspective, as a batter who's got a lot of runs in Australia and also been on touring parties where you've made three hundreds and four hundreds consistently, I thought I'd just check with you on what you think on these things. Yeah, I think I, I think English cricket needs to look at the ball. I think the juke ball um, it encourages the seventy five mile an hour seam bowler in county cricket to be very successful. 75 mile an hour seam bowls are not going to be successful in, in test match cricket. The, the pitches are be better, particularly with the Kookaburra ball, the SG ball. It's just not going to be successful. You know, what you need in test cricket is 85 miles an hour plus and, and, and world class spin. And I think our system, you know, it just doesn't produce the 85 mile an hour bowler and the, and the, the real high class spinner. So we have to try and provide a system that that could, uh, could happen. And what would then be produced would be better pitches, which would allow batters the chance to bat for six to seven hours to get big, big scores. You know, last year in county cricket, uh, I think the average score was 260. You know, so you're picking players whose brains have been trained to get 260, and then in test cricket, you need 450. But the brains have been trained to get 260, so it's, it's just not, not going to be possible. So somehow in England and the system needs to produce better wickets that you know, 450 becomes the norm in county cricket. So then in test match cricket, that's your, your mentality. You, you arrive on day one thinking 450. You know, I, I just think, you know, the whole system needs to be looked at in England. I think quickly they can change the ball. They can go and use a, a Kookaburra ball for half the season. I'm not saying go for the full season. Why not try it for half the season? Uh, just to see if it improves our game anyway, shape or form. Uh, I, I don't think it's a quick fix. I don't think suddenly England are going to be the best team in the world. Uh, it looks like India have got another wicket. Ash, I can see yeah. you looking at the screen. Yeah, Great. It looks six, like, oh, six, yeah, yeah, you're all you're all over England. I'm afraid that's a, a concern for me on a Saturday afternoon. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's a system that uh, will always produce uh, 
cricketers that would be good with a duke ball when the ball's moving around. You know, we'll always be competitive here in England with, with a, a, a swinging ball. But, you know, if, if England really want to be the best team in the world, and that makes, you know, you be able to play with the Kookaburra ball, the SG ball, and all the different conditions around the world, I think we, we, would, we do have to change things in our system. Better pitch is a different ball. And if we have the draw in four-day cricket, it's not a problem. It's no problem at all because that means there's been lots of runs, lots of chance for batters to get big scores. And that means the bowling would have to be a little bit better to get the wickets. Um, but it's not going to just happen overnight. It'll take quite a long time. England have always had good test match teams. You know, you've played against many. We, 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 we've always had good teams. But, you know, I want England to be the best team in the world. And, and the best team in the world for me is, is one that goes and wins everywhere. And, 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 and they almost do it twice round. They, they, they win and then, like the Aussies, the, the late 90s, early 2000s, the West Indies of the 80s. Um, you know, you guys are, are, have done it recently. But, you know, I still think for you to be that great, great Test match team, you've got to do it again. You know, the Aussies, they kind of went around the world twice, beating everyone. And you go, yeah, they're a legendary team. You know, the West Indies in the 80s, they did it. They just went around the world beating everyone twice. Um, you know, and, and England, that's what my aim and, and drive to the, to the team would be. And, and the, the kind of ECB network and set up, you know, try and get a, a, a system here in the UK um, that would allow England to have a, a team that can compete in all aspects in the world. At the minute, I just don't think they've got they've got a system ready to be able to produce that. Uh, with, I mean, just to respond to what you said, with the modern day technology and, uh, technology and analytics that's currently present, if a team can actually do what the West Indies and the Australians did in the 90s and 2000s, if they can replicate it twice around, that will be one team that you'll be cherishing forever, I think, as a cricket yeah. fan or a cricket cricketer yourself. It's, it's, it's incredibly hard. Uh, but keeping that aside, you, you spoke about, we all know how good a test team England has been over the years. You know, over the decades, they've been a great test team, prided themselves on red ball cricket, uh, hung back on white ball cricket for a very, very long time. But the resurgence happened after the 2015 World Cup mm. uh, exit for England. Uh, the resurgence has been quite amazing that even, even off late, I saw your tweet saying, England in the final, who's going to play them in the final in Australia? That was the tweet. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of confidence, but there's also a lot of work that's gone behind, right? And yeah. could the white ball cricket, could the growth of white ball cricket in any way be inversely proportional to the red ball game? Is there a possibility yeah. that a lot of cricketers want to uh, I mean, there is a massive difference as, as someone who's playing red ball and also seeing what's happening with white ball game right now. The techniques and the requirement for a batter to get through a white ball game is completely different. You don't need to. You can just get away with half a tonk and it'll go for a six instead of going to hand. So yeah. are these things playing a role at all? Uh, or would you just say the pitches and the techniques being a little... I, I saw an interview of Nass and Rob Key recently and very nailed it. He was absolutely... You know, he was... It looked like he was feeling for it. He was very genuine. I mean, he spoke about the techniques of batters and stuff. Uh, or is it a combination of both? What do you think? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I mean, the technical side of the game is completely different now. You know, you, you look at T20 cricket and the way that the players strike the ball. I, I, I love it. I, I love watching it. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's hands to the ball. You know, in Test Match cricket, you've got to allow the ball to get to you. You know, and so many of the, the modern players, understandably, they, they take their hands to the ball because they want to strike it. You know, it's almost like the reverse that you need in test match cricket. When you're up against high quality, you've got to allow the ball to get to you and you play with your hands tight and, and close to your, your body. Um, you know, and also the hit movement, the way that these guys, you know, they, they, they step hit one step down and they kind of produce a golf swing, get that right hit through the ball. Um, the ball generally in white ball cricket, if, if anything, it angles back in. You don't see much shape away, you know, which allows that. Bumps, you know, yeah, a little it's bit, bumps. yeah. Yeah, so that technique of step hip and the rotation of the hips is fine when the ball's kind of coming back in. Um, you know, I, I, I personally know if I was a player coming through this this era, would do exactly what the modern player is doing. You know, try and be a, a, as good a white ball player as I could be. And if that allowed me to be a test player, fantastic. You know, I'd, I'd try and be both. But, you know, young players that come through the system, if you actually look at it, say, say it's like a university course, you know, there are more opportunities and jobs um, studying white ball cricket than there are studying red ball cricket. So you go to university to study red ball cricket, there's really only one 11 that can produce you a, a nice income and that's the, your international 11. So that's 11 places. 
you know, it, it, so I've studied four years at uh, university on test match cricket for 11 places, you know, to earn me a nice amount of money. Or I can go and study white ball cricket, and that gives me a chance of probably, oh, how many leagues around the world are there? <laughs> I mean, there's so many leagues, the 100 ball, T20, the Big Bash, the IPL, the PSL, the Caribbean Super League, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, UAE. There's so many leagues. That miss, so many. You got you the T10 league? <laughs> yeah. Have you counted the T10? <laughs> well, T10 as well. So, studying white ball cricket at university is what a young player should be doing. But what I'd, I'd hope is happening at that university for white ball is to say, come on, there's also this uh, there's this course around here that can also add you some more more skill levels for white ball cricket, and that's that's red ball cricket as well. I, I still think the best players in the world. Virat Kohli, Kane Williamson, Joe Root, uh, Steve Smith, Marnus, uh, Babar Azam, all the real quality players that I, I would pay huge amounts of money to watch play, they're still brilliant white ball players. They're still, they're still the best white ball uh, test players, white ball players. Uh, I still think there is a role for that, that stylish player. In, even in T20 cricket, I still feel that the best T20 teams in the world have a, a consistent player. They have firecrackers and they have what I call uh, cracker jacks at the top of the order, in the middle, down that bottom end. But they always have one player that can just just play, you know. And I just think, you know, that 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 for me, I hope is the message coming through the coaching system that you know, yeah, you can be powerful, you can be that striker, you can be that, you know, that uh, stylish player at the top of the order that's purely there to go and disrupt and hit sixes, hit fours, but. You know, I'd hope most young young kids would look at the Babar Azams and Virat Kohli's and Joe Roots and go, that, that's the style of player that I'd like to be, because that allows you to play all formats of the game. It takes a lot of toll, though. It's not that easy. It needs a lot of no, hard no. work, too. Uh, it brings me back to this question that I've been wanting. It's been going in my head as well. I've been wanting to ask. Uh, you spoke about so much passion. Uh, you spoke with so much passion about the red ball game, test cricket, first class cricket. And when you spoke about T20 cricket, you, your eyes lit up. You spoke about hip hip movements, golf swing, and all that sort of stuff. Now, where does this leave the ODI game, uh, Michael? Uh, we've got test cricket, which has really gone. Uh, I would say it's been a little popular over the last two years, especially during the COVID break. I don't know what it is. People have just suddenly found time and have started admiring test cricket. They have time for the T20s. Where does where does that leave ODI cricket in? Uh, yeah. How do you see uh, it? Is there any innovation that you're looking at? Uh, and where do you see it? I'll, I'll be honest with you, Ash. I, I, I think there are too many formats in the game for it all to survive you know test match cricket has to survive it, it, it's it's the thing it's the heritage of our sport you know it's it, it's and i hope in 50 years time you know we're all still talking about test match cricket like we do now it's just the best format um i i do think we have an issue with t20 cricket and 50 over cricket you know if, if we really want to my, my, dog, my dogs are getting a bit live with the postman's here so I'll just shush, shush, shush. Sorry, no worries. Rowley, shut up. <laughs> shush, shut up. Come, come, here. <laughs> come here, come here. Sorry, I'll show you. I'll show you. Rowley, come here. Look. <laughs> Hi. Say hello, Rowley. <laughs> now go and shut up. Don't bark. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think. It's just how the administrators and how you players kind of come together and try and work out what is the best solution for, for, for a lot of problems that the game has at the minute. You know, test match cricket, I think most people agree we have to keep at the pinnacle. So let's make sure that we have windows where test match cricket is played. I like the test match championship. It might be that we don't play quite as many tests. You know, maybe we just cut back on the tests and there's more prominent series and you know more windows around the calendar that's just test match cricket because i think it's quite hard for the cricket fan to to follow cricket because there's so many formats and you know india could be playing t20 cricket uh, england could be playing test match cricket and another country could be playing 50 over cricket at the same time you go you know let, let's try and simplify and and have windows in the calendar where this is our test match cricket window where everyone plays test cricket for this month and then we go and do T20 cricket and we play T20 cricket for that month. And then there's an IPL league. In and amongst all that, I, I think it's very, very difficult to continue with 50 over cricket as well. And it might be that the only 50 over cricket that's played 
is every four years a World Cup. Maybe that's the way they go. I don't know. There'll be the there'll be the uh, the diehards as oh yeah, but how do you get good at fifty over cricket if you don't play it? I know you players. You 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 can play twenty over cricket. Fifty over cricket now is just an extension of T Twenty cricket. The, the players just try and bat like they're doing T20 cricket for 50 over. That's why you're seeing 350, 400 regular. Um, I, I just can't see how, how everything survives unless we we get together and, and come up with a, a, a kind of strategic solution. Um, and it might be that we just play 50 over cricket every four years. It's a massive cash cow for the game. Huge uh, broadcasting deals. Massive sponsorship. Uh, generally from India. <laughs> That's pretty much the truth. India provide all the sponsorship. But... You know, it's obviously a, a, an important cash cow, but in and amongst those four years, um, do we need to play as much 50 over cricket? And, and I also don't think we need to play as much cricket, full stop. I think now and again, having a breather from cricket uh, and not seeing the Indian side for a month, not seeing the Indian <laughs> side for six weeks, I just think it, 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 be, it, it gets us all wanting to see you more. You know, sometimes less is more. And I feel, for, I, I, I'll be honest, I feel for the likes of, India, I feel for England because you know the, the boards want to make so much money, and and obviously the money keeps coming in. But for that money to come in, you guys have got to play a lot of cricket. You know, and it's almost too much, and and, and I don't want to get I'm, to the I'm stage where players get very unfortunate out. for you. You need to see our faces. <laughs> I just I, I just don't want to get to a stage where potentially we start losing players earlier than we should because they play too much cricket. I'd rather a little bit less is more. Um, uh, and again, it, it's going to take uh, the powerhouses at the ICC and, and the powerful three, Australia, India and England, to get together and go, OK, let's now start to be sensible. Because at the minute, it's overkill. There's too much. And we've got to try and simplify it for the fans, but also make it uh, a little bit more more easier for the players. I just think you guys get on a treadmill and you're just non-stop. And, and, and we, we expect broadcaster, we all come on, your performances should be so high, give us drama. It's impossible, impossible for human beings to produce drama and high class performances all the time because, you know, you guys need an edge. You need an edge to, to, to be really looking forward to that game. Every game internationally should be a massive event. And I just think with the amount that gets played, it almost becomes just another game. And I don't think international cricket should be just another game. I've seen I've seen some uh, comment that Sachin Tendulkar had recently made on how he misses Tri Nation series. You know, Bef before the, when there was ODI cricket, there used to be a lot of Tri Nation series, and it was never about bilateral series. And he said that context is probably missing, and that's something we can look at. Um, mm. Anyway, just rolling on one uh, a couple of questions before I let you go, and you can go back to your golf. Uh, what do you think about the associate nations? Uh, because as of now, there are a lot of leagues happening around the world. Then you've got some international cricket happening. Uh, but over a period of time, with a lot of white ball cricketers emerging, the requirement for more options, is there a role that the associate nations could play? Is there an opportunity for uh, the nations that are already in uh, to enable them to play more cricket or sort of at least give them belief towards that? Where do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that we have to try and grow the game. And I think T20 cricket is, is the best format to try and grow the game globally. And it might actually be T10 that en ends up in the Olympic, you know, even a shorter version. Um, uh, and I've always said that we, we, we shouldn't be, uh, as cricket people, just thinking, all right, we've got enough. You know, we shouldn't be saying, oh, we've got enough countries now playing it. I, I want to see every country in the world playing cricket. You know, why not? You know, we, we, we want it to be a global sport. Um, the associate nations, I mean, you're looking at Afghanistan in the Under-19 World Cup, got close to making the final. Lots of their young players. Uh, you can imagine the leagues around the world are looking at all those mystery spinners going, we'll take, we'll take a couple of those into our leagues, which is great. And, and maybe that's the way to, to really grow the, the associate nation players is by giving them opportunities in all these leagues around the world, you know, and getting them into franchise systems and, and, and give them a chance of being around IPL franchises and teams and getting the chance to be uh, around the coaches and the great players in the dressing room and, uh, experiencing the the big energy crowds that uh, you guys get in India, um, you know it, it, it's it's a remarkable story what Afghanistan have, have delivered over the last few years. You go back to many many years ago, Sri Lanka winning the World Cup in '96. So you have to start somewhere, you know. And, and all, all these associate countries, 
they're, they're, they're starting at the bottom, but you can see that their, their growth levels have been very strong over the last few years. And it's just opportunities and it's, it's giving them series at the right time, you know, giving them the, the, the right amount of games and, and cricket to, to try and give them that experience. But with all these leagues around the world, I, I do think a lot of the players will get better quicker because they will all be a part of these T20 leagues, which will be, which will be great for the game of cricket. Wonderful. We've got some players registered for the IPL this year from Namibia and Ireland. We've got five players from Ireland and three from Namibia, which I think is a great start. Uh, anyways, uh, have you been following the English under-19 team uh, at the World yes. Cup this year? Uh, yes. can, you give us a, can you give us a few names? Forget about today's game. It's done. Can you give us a few names? <laughs> uh, well, Jacob Bethel, you'd have seen the left-hander. Um, his father was my captain at club cricket at the same club that Joe Root was at. So, Graham uh, Bethel's dad would have captained me and... Joe Root's dad, Matt. So Joe's dad would have played in a, a team with Graham. Um, so he's a, a he's come from Barbados, but we don't mind nicking up from Barbados. Uh, we've got a great academy. Uh, Joffre Archer came through our uh, Bayesian uh, academy system as well. Um, I, I like the like uh, James Rue, a young left-hander from Somerset. Uh, George Thomas, Somerset, at the top of the order. Uh, Rihan uh, Ahmed, the leg spinner. I think he's got a, a, a fantastic career. It uh, looks like he's a bit cheeky as well, which I like. I like a little bit of cheek. Um, oh, they, they all look great. They, they, they've just got to get opportunities, and, and they're all with counties. They'll be, um, you know, what 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 the, the world is that's different to, to when I played is that this has now got a massive profile. You know, yeah. all these young players that are playing, everyone's watching this World Cup final today. Uh, they're all on social media. Uh, everyone seems to know more about the players these days than certainly when I was uh, coming up through the system. So what this does is bring them a bit of pressure really, a bit of profile. Um, and let's see which one ones of the uh, come through the county system this year. What, one thing's sure in English cricket, if you're a young player, uh, you're going to get given a chance because there's, uh, there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities uh, going forward with the England side. And I, I, I could say that it's probably the best time to be a young cricketer in England because you know they're, they're going to get great chances in four-day cricket. Uh, it, it won't be long before they you know, to start get, getting talked about in the test match team. Uh, and the white ball team, it, it's just a, it just looks like a, a fantastic um, structure that Owen Morgan's created in, in the England white ball team. It looks fun, it looks fearless. Um, and it looks like it's it's the kind of team that you'd want to try and be around because they all, all look like they're having a bit of fun. So, uh, yeah, it's a good time to be a young player, but somehow we've got to try and find another 200 runs in this <laughs> under-19 final. But my man right. James Rue, he's 26, 26 from 50 odd. So he could be the man, he could get him to 250. You, you mentioned his name from Somerset, but I'm going to let you go now. But before that, one final question. Uh, can you just tell us about your relationship with Wasim Jaffer? Is it just a relationship that you have on social media or do you guys plan it? How does it work? No, it's, um, well, it, 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 was, it was my first test wicket, Wasim. So it goes back to... 2002, where he, he snuck the ball up the slope at Lords, uh, caught first slip. So um, he, he can't have been that good with the bat if he got out to me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did you? Been. Did you get Sachin Tendulkar out through the gate as well? Yeah, yeah. But you know, Sachin was just being nice to me. But Wasim actually actually bowled. You know, he got the outside edge. Oh, we have a bit of fun. I, I really enjoy. He, he, he gets. I'm sure he'll be. I haven't seen Twitter today, so I, I'm waiting. Obviously, the under 19s uh, get a good hammer in which they look like they might be doing it. He, he, he'll react today, Wasim. I'm waiting. He'll come up with something. Because I saw your post this morning saying, calling out Wasim for something. I'm sure he's after you right now. So uh, I'll let you go and I'll let you have some fun on social media tonight. And thank you so much for doing this. It was a wonderful cricket conversation. I completely enjoyed it. And keep being yourself, Michael. It's a lot of entertainment on social media. Thank you very much, Ash. Cheers, man. Thank you. Cheers.